book of Acts, chapter number four. Book of Acts, chapter number four. And let's stand together. We're going to read from verse 31 through down through verse 37. This actually goes on into chapter five. There really probably shouldn't be a break in the chapters. I think they broke it there, the translator, because one side shows the uh, saints in their sharing and the other side shows sin that now gets into the church and how God deals with the first sin that comes inside the church that Satan always is trying to get inside. So let's deal with the first part today and next week we'll deal with that other side that was going on here. Verse 31, Acts chapter 4, And when they had prayed, the place was shaken, where they were assembled together, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and they spake the word of God with boldness. And the multitude of them that believed were of one heart and of one soul. Neither said any of them that all of the things which he possessed was his own but they had all things common. And with great power gave the apostles witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. Neither was there any among them that lacked, for as many as were possessors of lands or houses sold them and brought the price of the things that were sold and laid them down at the apostles' feet. And distribution was made unto every man according as he had need. And Joseph, who by the apostles was surnamed Barnabas, which is being interpreted the son of consolation, a Levite and of the country of Cyprus, having land, sold it and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. Feet. Father, in Jesus' name, now, Lord, we have read from your precious word, and I pray now, as always, that you will anoint me to preach and open my understanding and my uh, vocabulary that I may say only that that is needful today. And I pray, Father, as we look at this, you will speak to us. And we will receive the message you have for us. And we may have a greater understanding of the word here. And Lord, it will be clear to us how the church is supposed to operate and how we're to take care of each other. Now, Lord, I pray as always that you hide me behind the cross. Help me to decrease as you increase in the message. Help me not in way to block the view of the cross today. But may I magnify you and may we see Jesus in his name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Be seated. We are looking today at the sharing of the saints, how they share, how they, the attitude they had toward one another and how they were to care for one another, those that were part of the church. We saw in the early part of the book of Acts something similar because over in chapter 2 he mentions that these things were happening. And now again after they have went through a time of persecution, Peter and John, and now having come through that and have went back to the church and give them the uh, message of what had happened to them. Now we see the church in a closer union than ever before. And once again, we see in view that they are caring for their own, for each other. This is something that's very, very important for the church. The church is responsible to take care of its people, those that are believers. Yes. We are to take care yes. of one another. Now, this doesn't mean that it's just if we are in a certain 
group. It means all believers, the churches. We must we can we can say churches in the sense of different different individual churches, but it's all one church. The church as a whole is to take care of all the family of God. Make sure that they're cared for. Here was what was happening because this was a time before we had anything like we have today where we're broken up into different denominations and many times each denomination think they're the church and they're the only church. Well, I would say maybe maybe most of them, uh, not that way, but one or two have the idea that they are the church and if you're not a part of their denomination, you're not a part of the church. So they... Uh, do not go outside of their denomination when they show or care for the saints. But here, the church was in its infancy, and it was all one, and it was all together. We see that Paul has went to Jerusalem, and they have, uh, or he, he uh, has met with Peter earlier, and we also uh, know that he, later on, when Paul comes on the scene, uh, we're, 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 we're uh, looking over in, into the book of Galatians, but when Paul comes on the scene and the Gentile church is put in place with the rest of the church, they all become one. They all become one. And the believers, and you'll see in Paul's writings, uh, later on, and also in the book of Acts, that Paul gets an offering from the churches that he has started and sends to the Jerusalem church to help with their needs. That means that they're all of one body. They were all one people. So they were concerned with the needs of the church at Jerusalem because they were having financial difficulties. One of the things that had happened when the day of Pentecost came, there were so many people in Jerusalem from other areas, and there, at that time, they got saved. And because of that, they have now become uh, new creatures in Christ and have become associated with the other believers that they didn't leave and go back to the place they were come from so they were now here without any way to make a living. There were also others that had gotten saved on the day of Pentecost and then later after Peter preaches again here after this healing that would have gotten saved and would have lost their uh, employment or what they were doing uh, because of their belief in Jesus because now they would have been considered outcasts. They were not uh, accepted anymore with the uh, Jewish elite. So there were those that had lost their positions of employment or a way to make a living. And now the church was responsible to take care of them and they saw that. They didn't have to be told. It was something that they did and that's what we see here. It says that when they prayed, the place was shaken. That means that God's power was among them. He was among them because they were yielded and faithful to Him. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. Now when you're filled with the Holy Ghost, you are bold in speaking the Word of God. You have no fear in proclaiming the word. That's what the church did. Now when you look at verse 32, you'll find the heart that they had. Because it says, the multitude of them that believed were of one heart and of one soul. Now this is the attitude of believers. When you have folks that claim they are believers, but they are not one with other believers, then there's a problem somewhere. Because here they were one heart and one soul. Why are we like that if we're believers? Because every 
person that is a believer, his heart has been changed. Yes. He has been yes. created a new creature. So there is an identification with anyone else that has the same heart. Also, we have been filled, or the Holy Spirit has come to indwell us, and now all believers having possessed the Holy Spirit are connected, and we sense that, we know that, we have that, that uh, uh, relationship and that identification with other believers if we are truly saved. And that's why we wonder why there's problems in churches if all are believers. Why would there be problems in churches? Mm -hmm. Now, if there is an issue come up where there is a discrepancy in doctrine or something, then there has to be a stand taken there. But it needs to be taken without any kind of anger or hatred. It needs to be dealt with on a biblical basis because it is biblically unsound and it needs to be removed from the church. But when you have divisions and issues among believers, there's some problem there because believers should never have any issue. We are one heart and one soul. That's what he said. That's the way they were. All of these thousands of believers that had come together now were of one heart and one soul. And look at the attitude toward each other. Neither said any of them that all or any, that, that word uh, that word ought there is a word for any, any of the things which he possesses was his own, but they had all things in common. Now this was their attitude toward the possessions. That it doesn't belong to me, it belongs to God. And what God chooses me to do with it is His business. And I am to make sure that my possessions are available to any other believer that does not have or need something. My possession should be available to them. That was the attitude. Now I know today it's kind of hard to even see that, isn't it? Because we have such an attitude toward capitalism and, and uh, we have such an attitude toward what's mine is mine and what yours should be mine. <laughs> and uh, if I can get it, it yes. will be mine. Yes. And we have such an attitude toward that and a lot of that is from culture because of the culture we live in and, and it's promoted all through culture uh, that we have an attitude that is certainly uh, far unto the teaching of the Word of God when it's believers. But we must come to the place where we understand that whatever God has allowed us to have, it belongs to Him. We're the stewards of what He's allowed us to have. And because we're stewards, we have to be ready to distribute whatever he's allowed us to have when the time is right and when there's a need because we are only stewards of what God has given us. Yes. We certainly see in the book of James that we're not to hoard anything. And the scripture told us in the Sermon on the Mount, we're certainly not to do that because our uh, possessions should be laid up in heaven, not on earth. Because if our possessions are here, our heart is here. Because wherever your possession is, there's your heart. Yes. So he's telling us here that the early church had it very right. They had it right. Because it was in the beginning when there was no sin yet in the church to corrupt the church. Now it's fixing to next week. It will get in. But now, during this time, the church is pure. And the believers are all one heart, one soul, and everything they have, they understand, is not mine, but it's God's. <laughs> and I'm to use it for His glory to help others. So he said, what he possessed was, was not his own, but they all had all things in common. So verse 33, he said, and with great power gave the apostles witness of the resurrection 
of the Lord Jesus and great grace was upon them. Two things is revealed here when the church is operating pure. One is there will be great power in the church and the message the church gives out will be very powerful. It will affect those around it. That's what he said. With great power gave the apostles witness of the resurrection. The message, the preaching of the church when it is a pure church will be very powerful. It will have an effect on all of those without if it's a pure church. The second thing that will happen if it is a pure church, there will be grace upon them all. all. That's what he said. And the Lord, resurrected the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. That means that there will be favor of God upon them. And not only favor of God, but favor of the people. People will look at them as being real, genuine of God. There will be favor. So when a church is operating in its pure form, these two things will be that. And we look out today, and what do we see in the church world? Scandal after scandal after scandal. Yes. Everybody, if you talk to people and you mention the church, the first thing they mention as far as the world is that they'll tell you how sorry the church is or those that are involved in the church because there is first no purity in the yes, church. Yes. It has become very impure. And also there is no favor because the people certainly don't find favor or they don't view the church as being anything but some kind of a con game. We also see there's no power and because there's no power we have yielded to the world and trying to reach people through worldly means and through the method the world uses because there is no power anymore in the church. So we see the church in its impure form has no power and no favor. And yet we're trying our best through our own efforts to do something that God is not doing and trying to achieve something that is going to be nothing in the end but what man has been able to to make of his say, and is going to collapse. So in the early church, the pure church, there was power and there was favor because everyone was together in heart and soul and everyone knew that what they possessed was not theirs, but it was God's. Look at verse 34. <clears throat> Here he says, neither was there any among them that lacked? No one had a need in the church. Not a one. Every person in the church was taken care of. No one among them that lacked. For as many as were possessors of lands or houses sold them and brought the price of the things that were sold. So what did they see? They saw that there is a need among our brethren. We have brethren here. We have those that have yielded to Christ. Those that have become believers. And there's a need. So whatever we need to do to make sure there is no need, we will do. Because we have already considered that we have no possessions, it's not ours, it's to whoever needs it. So now what do they do? They go out and even sell their real property, their houses, their land. They sell that. And they take the money that they get from that, not put it in a bank, not put it in their pocket, not hide it, but they take it 
and they give it so others' needs will be met. Yes. Now, where do they give it? That's very important because we've got to see that. Verse 35, and lay them down at the apostles' feet. They didn't, uh, they didn't bring it to the church and put strings on it. <laughs> a lot of folks will give, but they yes. can control what they yes. give. You see that all the time. Yes. Oh, yeah. If I can tell you where to, what to do with this, I'll give. Mm -hmm. Now, when you have those people in the church, you better, you better immediately deal with that and don't accept anything they've yes. got because if you do... They will take control because their money gives them the right to control what goes on mm -hmm. when you accept money with strains. This is something I've always taught since I've been preaching. Wherever I've been, whatever church I've pastored, I've always said I will never receive an offering from anybody with strains attached to it. If they do not put it in the offering and leave it alone, then they need to keep it because yes. you cannot take money from anybody yeah. if there's any strings attached to it in the church. Never! Because it's always going to cause problems. <laughs> you pastors out there, any of you listen to this, and you are set up on these things of receiving people's money so they can dictate to you what you do with it or how that money is to be spent, you better change your way of receiving money and give it back to them because you're going to find out that's going to cause you problems. Yeah. And here they said they brought it and they lay it at the apostles' feet. Meaning that this is to be taken by the apostles those that are the leaders of the church that know what God wants done with it and have the discernment, we will give you authority to take this and do with it as God leads you to do with it. And it doesn't matter what you do with it, we have released it to you. And that's the way we're to view what we give to the church. Now what did he say? He said they laid down at the apostles' feet, look at this, and distribution was made unto every man according as he had need. So now the apostles have taken this that they have brought. And they are the ones that give it out. They give it out according to the needs of the people. And everyone's need is met because that's what it said in verse 34. Neither was there any among them that lacked. Nobody lacked anything. Everybody had what they needed. Now this would work today if the church was pure and operated this way. You would see this today. You would see there would not be any Christians that are uh, true believers that are without or have not, uh, don't have their needs met if we were operating properly today. But I tell you, it's a shame. But in a lot of churches, there will be people actually in that church that are believers starving and they won't even know that they have a need. That's the bad thing. That's the bad thing. That's right. There will be people that are out there that desperately have needs and the church, the elders, the pastor won't even know that there's a need out there. And the members come in and out and many of them may know about it but won't even share it. Mm -hmm. Because we live today sure. in an impure church where it's all about me and mine. And then if there is a need, what we do instead of meeting the need is try to blame the person that has the need and say it's because of something they've done or something they're not doing if they have a need. And no wonder God's not blessing. That's right. But yet we'll build multi-million dollar buildings mm -hmm. so somebody can see that. Mm -hmm. We will furnish them with the most elaborate thing so someone can see that. 
We'll spend multi-millions of dollars on all the electronics and all the things that make up the electronic church today. And we do not even know that there are people there that have needs. The early church wasn't interested in building buildings. They weren't interested in elaborate things. They weren't interested in furnishings. They were interested in people. And when it's not about people, it's not about God. Amen. It's got to be about people. Because Paul and his writings all through, but especially in the book of Philippians, the first thing he says to me to live is Christ. My life is to be lived for him. And I am to live in his life for his glory. And then I am to esteem others better than myself. It's not about me ever. It's never about me. That's the attitude that we're to have. So he said they laid them down at the apostles' feet. And distribution was made unto every man according as he had need. Not according as those decided what he would have, according to his need he was given. Now, look at verse 36. Now what he's going to do, Luke is doing here, he's going to identify one individual and show how he came and sold his property and brought it. And then when we look on down in chapter 5 next week, we'll see that he identifies two other people that also did the same thing that Barnabas did, but they did it for the wrong reason and the wrong motive. Here in verse 36 and 37, we see someone that had a true motive for what they did in bringing their offering, selling their property, bringing it to the apostles. In chapter 5, we're going to see now those that had impure motives for bringing theirs and played the hypocrite and how God dealt with the first hypocrites in the church. And he was setting a precedent there of how the church is to remove all those that are Hypocrites. Now look at verse 36. And Joseph, who by the apostles was surnamed Barnabas. Now this is a name the apostles had given him because they knew him. And they gave him this name because it was interpreted to mean the son of consolation or the son of encouragement. Barnabas was such an encourager that the apostles had renamed him from Joseph to Barnabas. And we see his attitude here. You can always see that in Barnabas. Barnabas was the first one that took Saul of Tarsus after his conversion and befriended him and took him to the churches, telling the churches that he was now a believer and a preacher of the gospel. Barnabas went with Paul on his missionary journeys. Barnabas' uh, nephew, or I believe it was his nephew, was John Mark, and he encouraged him to go on a mission journey. And then John Mark left and, and didn't uh, stay. And then when they came back for the, and started back the second time on the missionary journey, uh, <coughs> Barnabas wanted to take John Mark because he was always an encourager. He wanted to encourage people. Paul refused to take him, so they split up, and Barnabas and John Mark went in one direction, and Paul and Silas went in another. We also know that Barnabas' sister, John Mark's mother, is where the church met on many occasions. The church was actually in her house. You can see that later on in the book of Acts. So here was a man that everyone knew was an encourager. So they named him that. He also says he was a Levite. So the Levites were the priestly tribe. And he was from that tribe. 
But he was also of the country of Cyprus. He was living in Cyprus at this time. So he probably had property in Cyprus. Now the Levites were not given property when the land was divided. It was kind of unusual, but now he's kind of left that and, and gotten out on his own and has purchased property. Look at verse 37, what he did with it. Having land, sold it, and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. He saw that there were needs in the church. He's no, he, he, he realized that his land that he had was not his. It was God's. And now he has sold that because he wants to give that to the Lord. And he brings all of the proceeds, all of it, and lays it at the apostles' feet and leaves without any strings attached to it. He gives it to God. I've heard of different people doing this. I, I saw men that have, have sold what they had and gave it, gave it to the church. Because there's one thing that you can never do, and that's out give God. That's right. If God, if you give what you have to God, God will certainly make sure your needs are met. Can't out give God. You can never give yourself into poverty. You can hoard yourself into poverty. You can uh, uh, live in luxury and go into poverty. You can do all kinds, of, but you can never give your way to poverty. The book of Proverbs is clear on that. When it talks about there are those that give and yet how, and there are those that keep out nothing. <coughs> that's what happened to Barnabas. Now if we were to look at this and if we were to learn from it today in the church and go back to this we could see God again bring the church to power and faith. But a lot of folks today, when they preach from these verses, they want to set this as not a biblical precedent that we should look toward upholding today, but they want to look at this as being something that happened during the early church that never continued then you've got to say, but why didn't it continue? Because that, the church here is in its purest form. Why wouldn't it continue? The only reason it wouldn't continue is if we have allowed sin and impurity to get in and change the way we view things. Because that's what happens in chapter 5. I don't think that the church operated in its purest form is something that we shouldn't continue on with. Look to me like that would be something we should be prepared to try to achieve all the way through the church is how it operates in its earliest state, in its purest form. Instead of trying to say, well, that's not something that continued and, and was carried through. And I hope we will always realize that everything we have, if God allows us to possess anything, <coughs> is not ours, it's His. I know Corey Tim Boone, a great Christian, yes. that was in the Holocaust and had spent time in the prison camps, the Jewish uh, prison camps during the time of Hitler's regime. And Corey Ten Boom said, don't ever hold anything tight in your hand. Because it hurts when God has to pry your fingers yes. apart. Yes. 
take it. Always hold it loose. Hold your hand open so God at any time can take it if he wants it. And I think that's why. Because from her perspective, she had learned that. And I think God is telling us here, don't ever take anything that he has allowed you to to be an overseer of, or he has allowed you to be a steward of, don't ever take that as your own and clamp it down as being yours and never available for his use. You know, when we do that, we're just getting ready for God to have to deal with us in a harsh way. I think that goes with anything, whatever we have. Because you see folks many times, they get so attached to things yes. or to people or to things. And, and, and there are folks that are so attached to a certain piece of property, like a piece of uh, real property or a house, that that almost becomes their God because that directs their life. And they could never even, even conceive of not having that or of having to give that up or, or even sell it or get away from it. That's, that's what their life is built around. There are a lot of folks that God can never use because they will not move from where they are. This is my home. I built this. I, 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 uh, this is where I... And, and they would never even think about moving away. That they become attached, they're holding that God can use. If we're ever to be used by God, it's when we turn loose of everything. And we know that God is in control. Wherever He chooses me to go, whatever He chooses me to do, whatever He chooses to do with me. It's not my business. It's not up to me. It's up to him. And I'm to yield to that. And I'm to be faithful there. Next week, we'll look at the sin as it gets in the church. And those that wanted to be recognized as part of us and get the recognition, but they didn't have the attitude of Barnabas See how God deals with this thing. Our Father in Jesus' name, oh, how we so desire to be your church in its purest form. Lord, we know that there are many things that we need to need to be aware of. And there are so many things that it's so easy for us to get caught up in that will lead us astray. <clears throat> so easy to get our eyes on the culture and on <clears throat> the way of life and the nation we live and somehow replace the truth of God with something that culture has given us. Lord, I pray that we will recognize that we belong to you, that everything that we have is just something you have allowed us to be stewards of, and it's not ours. And help us, Lord, to realize that our home is on the other side. Our treasures are on the other side, not here. Lord, I pray that we live every day face toward us. We can say as Paul, for me to live as Christ, to die as gain. 